there'll always be those people that you're trying to beat. And that's always a bit of an issue, even if the platform can, can help you. Peter Herring again, welcome to the podcast. How's it going today? It's going really well. Thanks very much. Awesome. I'm pleased to have you here. So let's begin with what is one quote that inspires you? Yeah. So, um, you know, being in trading for a long time, one of my favorite books, and I'm sure a lot of people that listen to this are familiar with it, which is reminiscences of reminiscences of a stock operator. Um, and there's a great quote in there. Um, at one point he says, if a man didn't make mistakes, he'd own the world in a month. But if he didn't profit from his mistakes, he wouldn't own a blessed thing. And uh, that's always been my, uh, that's always worked for me because I feel like I'm making mistakes all the time. So at least I can be learning from them. That's awesome. Uh, that's a great quote. So for people who don't know you right now, tell people a little bit about who you are and just some background about yourself. Sure. Um, so my background is uh, primarily in capital markets. Uh, got involved in trading uh, out of college, doing an arbitrage system that uh, my friends and I traded that I had developed. Um, worked at Bank of America for a little while. Uh, worked on the trading floor in Chicago in the 90s and then came out to San Francisco at the end of the 90s into the 2000s, um, where I was trading currency options in Chicago and then equity options here in San Francisco. So I did that for a while while that was a good business. I uh, went from being a really good business to be on the trading floor to being not such a good business. Uh, so I left that and a few years later, I uh, did my first startup. So it was in 2007. Uh, and I was like, I like to say the fourth most important out of four founders um, of a company that was called Sentient Technologies, which was essentially an evolutionary learning company. Uh, it was an AI company, essentially we were evolving trading strategies. Um, so it was there uh, for about six years, um, helping that get going and um, helping with things like, you know, inputs to the system and uh, what kind of, what the actual fitness function of the, uh, of the evolution was. Um, and then I left in about 2013 and started getting interested in blockchain and thought there might be some interesting things to do with that tech uh, and started going to blockchain and Bitcoin and Ethereum meetups uh, in Silicon Valley in San Francisco in like 2014, where I ran into my partner, who was the other old guy in the room. And we started talking about what you could do with the with the technology and we sort of ended up uh, ended up with what we're building now. So from what I see, a lot of it almost from the beginning was about technology pretty much. And you can have a focus for trading also, but you focus on, on using it with, with technology. Uh, yeah, that's, that's true to a certain extent. Although certainly when I was on the, you know, when I was on the trading floor in those days, it was, it was, um, you literally had uh, option valuations printed on a lot of pieces of paper and you were like flipping madly through the pieces of paper as the, as the market moved. And then you had to look at what the model said and then make the adjustment in your head. And so, and those, that, those days it was, I mean, not a manual process, obviously you're using your brain, but um, it, that was, uh, the, the technology was not super high there, but we all knew where it was going. Uh, we all knew that that was, you know, the days of open outcry were going to end. And so, uh, you know, at the company, we started working towards, um, you know, using some tech to, to come up with some better solutions for ourselves. Awesome. So let's talk about that. Tell me more about how do you get involved in trading in the first place? How did that happen? Well, so I was dating this girl uh, in college and, uh, uh, her father was involved in something that had to do with options and especially uh, options on futures. And I knew nothing about it. And I sort of learned about it. And I was fascinated because um, you know, the leverage and the idea of being able to make all this money on a relatively small investment. Um, being young, I didn't think as much about being able to lose a lot of money very quickly. Um, but I, I got very interested and started following the markets. Uh, and then really, literally the first thing that I, I worked on um, was one day and was watching the precursor to CNBC and uh, noticed that there was a, they were talking about different futures, uh, different equity futures or equity index futures, and that there were different premiums, even though, you know, you were looking at basically a stock index, they had some, one would be trading at a discount, one would be trading at a, at a premium. And so we came up with the idea of, of doing an arbitrage. Uh, between the futures index based on which one was trading under the cash and one was trading over. And the markets were so inefficient in those days. We literally, we were in Colorado. We called a broker in Denver who like wired the order into somebody in Chicago who sent it down like on a sort of telex machine to a person. They tear it off in a piece of paper, hand it to a runner, fold the piece of paper over, run over to the pit, 
hand it to a guy who's standing outside, look at it, turn around and give it to a person. And the whole process probably took two minutes, right? Uh, and you, we actually could make money on an arbitrage uh, because the markets just weren't, you know, they weren't terribly efficient at that point. And so even though we had a really long term turnaround time, uh, we were able to make some money at it. Um, eventually we moved to Chicago and started doing it with direct lines down to people. It was still just a phone to a person, right? It wasn't very fast. And yet you could still, still make money at that stuff for a little while anyway. And how was your learning curve back then? How did you learn to do this? Was it through having a mentor or you have to kind of go through some tough time first to learn? So in terms of the arbitrage that we were doing, um, the learning curve, uh, you know, we kind of invented that. And uh, my friends started working on, you know, using using computers to, to bring in the signal and like kind of detect the signal in a more automated way. In fact, in 1986, when we brought in one of the first, like, like an early IBM PC into this trading office, um, one of the like people were standing, you know, sitting around the office at the end of the day and they, they looked and they're like, what do you need a computer in trading for? Like, what is this, Star Trek? I mean, why, why do you have a computer? They had no idea what we could be doing. Um, But uh, I think the, but for us, you know, we did this arbitrage strategy and it worked really well um, until kind of the world caught on because whenever you have these little, you find these little things that work like this, a little arbitrage, a little inefficiency in the market, they work for a while, but the market's smart. People are smart. They figure it out. And um, we went from having, you know, something that made money relatively steadily for us to, to something that just just didn't work anymore because the markets were too, too quick. And then we went into trading other things and, and trying to do more speculation. And I would say that the learning process there was uh, usually painful because usually it was learning from doing something silly or, you know, putting on too much risk. Um, and so I think in that, uh, in that case, that was a, a, a slow process of learning what risk is by kind of, burning your fingers every, you know, every now and then. Um, but then I think from, for, for me, learning was, you know, it, it you know, it continued, right? I mean, you, you're never done. And so then I went to Bank of America, I learned working, uh, working um, upstairs there, went on the trading floor, um, learned with some more formal trading with an options group, uh, and then obviously going and, and trading, uh, trading in the pit. And then there's, you know, a lot more learning that goes on. Did you have some maybe days where you felt like you didn't want to do trading anymore? You wanted to do something different, like days where you really fell down and don't want to trade anymore? Yeah, that definitely happened. There were days. There was a day in, I think it was early 2000 when the internet bubble was just starting to break. Um, and uh, I usually had had long options positions, but I had like a short position and some puts down below the market and the market started dropping. And I realized very quickly that I was going to have a lot of short gamma working against me and the smart market was dropping very fast. So I just left the options pit and went over to the, we had like a Bloomberg machine you could execute stocks on and just started selling. It was like position in Adobe. And I, I just started selling stock that I knew if it dropped another dollar, that would be my Delta. So I was trying to stay just a little ahead of it and I'm selling and then it drops a little more and I'm selling and I'm drops a little more. And uh, it just kept collapsing. The price went from like $98 down to like 75 or something. And I was selling the whole way down. Um, and all of a sudden it hit like 75 or 74, rallied a couple of dollars, kind of stalled and rallied a couple of dollars. And then it started rallying and I realized that all of this stock I'd sold was going to bite me. Uh, so I started buying it on the way up just the same way that it, you know, I had been selling it and I'm buying it and it goes up a buck and I'm buying it. Stock goes back to around $90. I look at the machine I had bought. I think I'd sold 50,000 shares. I had bought 50,000 shares. My average sale price was like $84 and two cents. My average buy price was like $84 and five cents. I managed to take like an incredibly small loss out of it. Um, sweating, stressed out, exhausted. And I looked up at the clock and it was nine o'clock in the morning because I had four more hours of the trading day to get through. So um, yeah, I was, I, I did kind of wonder about my career choices at that point. And what was one of like your good days? What happened then? Um, there've been a lot of fun, good days. Um, actually a really good day that happened to me was uh, in December of 1999 trading and again adobe um the stock was going into earnings and the expiration was the day the day 
the, the later in the day that the earnings came out. Um, and uh, we had a situation where it had that stock had rallied like into every earnings or right after every earnings. And so the public was coming and buying call options like mad. And we and the pit were just, you know, basically selling options to the public in the week leading up to that. And we started, you know, you'd buy, you'd sell some, you'd try and buy them back. You kind of realized you couldn't get them back or you could, you'd have to pay up. Um, and at some point we went to a, we went to a point where the volatility of those options had gone from like 55, 60, where they normally were to 90 for the, for the out month. And the front month options were like a 250% volatility. Um, so I just went in, uh, massively short volatility into that day, which is not the way I normally trade. Um, the earnings came out and because so many people had bought calls, even though the earnings were good, there was nowhere for the stock to go. Like all those people who bought calls sold them. And as they sold them, that put selling pressure on the stock. The stock didn't move. So you had the, the public buying these options. We were selling them because we knew the vol was high, but didn't know what was going to happen. And um, the, the volatility just got crushed absolutely crushed. And that was, uh, at that point, that was the best day I'd ever had. Um, and basically made my year. Uh, and, and, uh, yeah, so that was, that was a really fun day and, um, set me up for being able to afford to buy a, a house in San Francisco back in, you know, which back in those days was cheaper than it is now, but still expensive. So I was pretty happy about that one. That was a fun day. But there was a lot of risk. I mean, if earnings had been bad and the stock had been cut in half, I was going to lose a lot of money. But every now and then you have to take the risk. Were you trading your own money back then or was it the funds money? Did you have some incentive to kind of not lose too much money? So we, it was um, at that point, we were a very small uh, trading group. So I had joined this group. Uh, so I was essentially trading the firm's money, but I actually we were so small that I had actually contributed some of the capital to it. And so like the first loss up to a certain point was going to be mine. Um, and then actually put past a certain point uh, that would have been the firm's loss, but it does create a kind of strange incentive, right? Because you're thinking, well, I don't want to take a small loss, but a big loss is okay. Uh, it's probably not. I don't think anybody had had that intention and that's not really how I traded it, but you, it, did, it was a little bit odd in terms of how they'd set the incentive structure up. I think unconsciously. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So how was the move to then moving to more technology side of trading? How did it happen? There's a couple of things. First of all, uh, while I was still with that trading group, we realized that we didn't have the same kind of edge just being in the pit and buying on the bid and selling on the offer. So uh, we started doing what was um, known as the dispersion trade, which essentially we were trading the, uh, the options on a stock index against the options on the individual stocks that made up that index. So uh, most of that development was done by the, the main partner that was in Chicago, but uh, I made a few contributions to that. Um, they seemed to help us and we moved in the right direction with that. But then in the end, that company ended up uh, folding at the end of 2001. Um, and then I think, uh, you know, I kind of got involved in doing some sort of automating, tr automated trading off the floor. Um, nothing terribly, earth shattering or, or great out of that, but that it did give me, uh, I did learn a lot, which put me in a good position to actually be, uh, to be more useful to the startup that I was involved in in 2007. And was it you who learned technology or did you have some partner that helped you to be able to do that? So I, again, was, I probably was the least um, tech focused guy uh, in that I was mostly coming in as the person who understood the markets. Um, and so we had like a guy who was a, robotics PhD. Um, we had someone who worked to, you know, in a number of tech companies and had run one. Um, we actually had uh, a guy who left the company within like a year uh, who ended up starting Siri and then selling it to Apple. So, um, but what my focus was, was for the, the learning technology for these things that were evolving to give, try to find ways to give the computer ways of seeing the price, like giving them certain indicators, certain information about the price so that the computer could then look at those and figure out how, and then it was gonna evolve through an evolutionary learning process, evolve essentially what would work and what wouldn't work. That was, uh, that was a fascinating thing. I mean, you started learning, I mean, everyone gets excited about AI, but um, one of the things you don't realize about it is when you're training a thing to do something and it is artificial, you don't always, you know, it doesn't do what you want it to do. It does what it's, what you incentivized it to do. And so you had to look at that and think, well, 
we're not just training it to make money, right? Because, you know, it, if it buys a stock and loses a thousand dollars and then the stock comes back and it makes $10 at the end of the day and it says, yeah, yeah, I won, I made money. Like you don't want that, right? You don't want that. That would be a, a, a bad thing to train the computer to do. So we had to figure out ways of making it like recognize what kind of losses it took within the day and, and you know, change the objective function of the thing in such a way that it, it, it thought that uh, taking too deep of a drawdown was a bad thing. I feel like these days people know the technology in trading. They know they have, like, they have a platform to trade. They have like a fancy computer and things. But they don't know how much technology they need. Like maybe they need AI or algos. So what would you see as the advantage of either an algo or AI in your trading? How does that help? Well, so, I mean, certainly the algos that we were using, um, we actually, like our clearing firm had certain ones we would use um, because we were putting on trades within the day. And then at the end of the day, you might have a large position and we just wanted to use them to kind of average our way out. Um, one of the things that we did learn with the with it and one of the ways that we trained the technology was not so much to look at what its outcome was on the day, but to look at kind of how it did over the course of the day. Because, uh, you know, the, the end of the day is um, somewhat arbitrary, right? I mean, it, it happens at a certain time, but from the standpoint of like the price movement or of a stock or a commodity, um, you know, how, how do you know? I mean, I guess you can, you can certainly tell the computer, you know, how much time is left. Um, but ultimately, it's almost random where that price is at the end. So we we're trying to make it realize uh, where it was over the course of the day was more important than where it ended up. And then in terms of the algos we were using, it was just to kind of average our way out of positions that we had because we knew at the end of the day, there wasn't really time for timing it. You just wanted to, you know, make get whatever, you know, whatever you'd gotten and then, and then be gone. Okay. So tell us about the AI that you're working on right now. And what is that so right for? now? We're actually not working on it. What we are, um, what we are working on is actually a platform for, um, for people to be able to design and trade customized derivatives. We're trying to kind of do for the hundred year old and extraordinarily large uh, international derivatives market. What, what Apple did for the computer, which is to make it intuitive and visual and very easy for people to use. Um, so we think one of the, you know, among the problems that people have with, with trading is that uh, you, you put a trade on and you think, well, what's the risk I have? Well, um, you can try to analyze it. You can think about it. You can think, well, what's, you know, what's a three standard deviation move? There's a number of ways of, of, of looking at it. But from our standpoint, we think that one of the problems is that a lot of these don't really work with the way the human brain does. So by making it visual and making it a situation where a person's actually looking at like a payout curve they would like in, in relation to movement and the underlying, and then using like a drag and drop technology to drag that curve where they want it. They're actually, that actually integrates with your brain. You actually understand that in an intuitive way. This is what I can make on this trade. This is what I can lose on this trade. And then, you know, we take that, do a number of things, break it into a number of small fungible pieces so we can get to liquidity with that. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, we want to actually sort of trade in, you know, change the way people can interact with, with trading and putting on more complex positions. I mean, ultimately it should be, uh, you know, like learning to drive or ride a bike or something like that, where, you know, you don't have to do a lot of training. You don't have to know a lot about options or something like that, but to be able to put on a trade that's relatively complex and know exactly what you're doing and, and know exactly what you're getting into. I feel like, especially with options trading, there's a lot of things that it's kind of like a barrier to entry for most beginners that get into trading for that. So it's hard to understand the numbers in the platform, even today that are quite hard to read. So that could be something really big, I think. Yeah. I mean, with options, I mean, I've, you know, I've been trading options for 30 years or something like that. And I mean, you can put positions on, especially if it's a liquid market, you can put something complex on, but uh, yeah, I mean, you want something that anyone would be able to use. Uh, I mean, there's a, when you look at derivatives markets and what they do, I mean, the most liquid derivatives markets and most of the activity is actually in financial instruments, right? I mean, the idea of a derivative is so that someone should be able to hedge their risk. Um, and if you're, you know, a small bank and you have real estate risk, you can't really hedge it. If you're, you know, growing, um, 
tea in Kenya or pepper in, in Cambodia, you, you, you can't necessarily hedge that risk in an effective way. And part of that is because in a lot of cases, there aren't the markets, but also um, there's a lot of knowledge you would have to have, right? And so again, by creating something very visual and intuitive, um, we want people to just, you know, drag and drop that, that curve and then, you know, know how much they, you know, think this is how much I'm going to lose if the price goes down, or this is how much I'm going to make if the price goes down, this is how much I'll lose if it goes up, this is how much the trade costs me, and then that's all they have to know, right? So that's, that's what we're working on and uh, been working on for the last few years. What do you feel has been the, the biggest kind of innovation in technology over the years in, in the training world? Was it like different platform or maybe the, the AI coming in? What do you think make, made the big difference so far? Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see what's happened with like, I mean, it's, you know, been a few years now, but I mean, when you look at what high frequency trading has done to, I mean, it's uh, obviously, they, you know, they've gotten very good at reading what people's orders are and the big orders. But I think if you're like a small trader, I mean, the market's become extremely efficient, right? You think about how tight the spreads are. That's just, that's just incredible. So, I mean, if you're, if you're smaller, it's probably a benefit to you. Um, if you're a lar if you're putting on larger positions, I'm sure they're, taking a quite a, quite a bit of edge out of you by front, you know, they realize, you know, figuring out where your trade is and getting ahead of it. I mean, there's certainly a lot of very good platforms that are going on. I'm very impressed by some of the ones, I mean, obviously this is what we're working on as well, but the ones that have simplified this process, I think about something like Coinbase in, in the cryptocurrency space. Um, remember when I first looked at Coinbase and, you know, it, it's just a simple thing, right? You look at it and it says, here's what it costs to buy. And here's what it costs to sell. You know, if you want to, if you want to put an order in to buy Bitcoin when it drops 500 bucks, yeah, you can't do it. If you want to, you know, sell it, if it goes down a thousand, you want to have like have a stop loss, you can't do it. You just, you just buy it and sell it. And my first thought when I saw that interface is this is kind of a dumb interface. It's so simple. You can barely do anything. All you can do is buy or sell with it. it it's really stupid. Um, and I know now they're going to have an IPO and they're going to raise a lot of money and uh, a dumb interface is probably worth $10 billion. So uh, I, I think that there's, Anything that makes it really, really simple for people, um, you know, is, is going to be the future of this. And I think that's one of the more important things that we people can work on is is simplifying this, right? And and making it so it's not just professionals who can have access to this, but and can do it in a safe way because hopefully they can understand what they're getting into. I feel like in some ways this might kind of separate the more experienced traders from the beginner traders or people that just like want to buy or sell Bitcoin or or, or any stock or any anything basically, but is that a good thing? Because I feel like people that when it's like really simple might not make money with, with that, especially Coinbase, when they have to buy or sell Bitcoin. So is, is there still the chance to make money for people who are not experienced or do they have to still learn trading to be able to make money? Well, you, you're going to have to learn a lot to, to be able to make money. I mean, you have to know where your edge is coming from. I think a lot of people just, they just trade and think, well, I think that's, you know, I think that's going to go up or something like that. And, you know, in a bull market that works, right? You know, most people think in terms of buying and when the market, you know, you get an up market, it's pretty forgiving, right? Like you buy the stock at the wrong time and it goes down a little bit, but then the market goes up and you get it out and you're okay. And you think, oh, I'm pretty smart. I'm pretty good at this. Uh, and that can lure you into some pretty bad mistakes. Um, but I think people, I, I mean, you know, you you need to know, you know, where the money you're trying to make is coming from, right? I mean, if you're a long-term investor, you're thinking, okay, great. I'm, I'm in this because I think, you know, these assets will go up in price. If you're doing arbitrage, you're thinking there's some kind of mispricing in the market that I'm finding. If you're a market maker, right, you're trying to get the bid-ask spread. Um, if you're trying to be like a, a speculator, I mean, I think you have to find something fundamental that the market isn't seeing um, and then maybe even know why the market's not seeing that. So, yeah, I mean, I think that definitely people jump in and, you know, think it's easy. And when it's going up, it does feel like it's easy. Um, but I think it's better if you can figure out where, you know, where is that edge? Where are those profits going to come from? Right. Is there a risk you're taking? Um, is there some, yeah, again, is there something the market doesn't see? I mean, I, I've been, been long golden Bitcoin for a while now. And, you know, it, it seemed kind of clear that gold should be going up. Right. Uh, and then, you know, you had to wait and see if the market was actually going to confirm that and tell you that you're right. But, you know, you can think, well, why is it right? Why do I believe that? Well, I can see what all the central banks are doing. Right. So there's a reason I can understand that. Um, 
as to why it didn't go faster and why it didn't, everyone didn't get on this trade. I don't know. That's a, it's, you know, longer, longer inquiry. Yeah. Do you think a platform could be able to solve that in the future where people don't really have to learn trading or is that kind of too far fetched? No, I think, well, I think, um, I think it depends, right? Um, it, it depends on what you're trading. Um, certainly in terms of the derivative space, I mean, that is what we are trying to build, right? We're trying to build something where, I mean, if you're trying to hedge a risk, you can put that hedge on um, easily without knowing a ton about trading. Um, if you are uh, if you are trying to speculate or bet on a market going up, um, you, you know you you can figure out what trade you're trying to to have on. Um, also, with the with the particular system we're building, because it breaks these things down into these smaller units, uh, there's going to be some opportunity possibly for AI to give some alerts to people about opportunities that exist if you can put in you know, the particular things you're after, you're saying, I'm looking for these cases where, you know, I have a 90% chance of winning on the trade, but maybe I make a 20% return or something like that. If you, you put in a set of parameters, it can search for that. So I do think that, that some, per, that some uh, platforms will, will help people do that. Um, you just kind of wonder, you know, will all, I mean, there will always be professionals putting a lot of money and effort to trying to be a little faster than you. So, um, That'll, there'll always be that, right? There'll always be those people that you're trying to beat. And that's always a bit of an issue, even if the platform can, can help you. But this sounds, in a way, really advanced and really amazing to me. So I'm sure people will uh, find this interesting as well, for sure. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> awesome. So Peter, what can people find you that will connect with you or reach out after this interview? Uh, so uh, there's two primary sources. Um, one, if they want to see like kind of what we're writing and what we're thinking, we have a Medium page. It's uh, medium.com slash Digital. And I should point out that gray in our case is spelled G-R-E-Y rather than G-R-A-Y. So G-R-E-Y Swan Digital. Um, if they want to contact us directly, they can just uh, email us at newfinance at grayswanmail.com. Again, the same thing with, the, with gray, G-R-E-Y. Uh, and um, yeah, we'd be happy to answer any in inquiries anyone has uh, about you know what we're working on. Awesome, thank you, Peter. This has been good. I appreciate your time and the advice you gave, especially your experience in the past. That was awesome to hear, and what's coming ahead, of course, is super interesting as well. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. I hope to talk to you soon. Great, thanks very much. I appreciate it.